younger ones. A commercial department, which would be like a business department, um, was another um, rather forward-looking aspect of Haskell education in the 1890s. Pretty surprising, really. But this is something that Indians themselves clamored for. This is something that they wanted. They realized very quickly that getting a, a remedial sort of grade school at best education in these places wasn't going to take them very far. So they asked for these uh, more elite schools to begin to offer some of these programs, which Haskell did as one of the larger schools, in fact the largest of the, the fully federally funded schools, Carlisle being only partially federally funded. Um, unfortunately the programs didn't last too long and it would be the 1930s really before they appeared again. Again, separation of the sexes, uh, boys and girls, awards, dormitories. Leisure activities I wanted to say something about because these were very, very popular with students and also with people in Lawrence. Something they um, actually connected um, to Haskell with is coming to see some of their, their sporting activities. Some of you may know that Haskell in the 19. Uh, tens and twenties played uh, colleges while they were still not even a, a high school, really, um, including KU, including um, what's the one I'm thinking of in Lindsborg, Fighting Swedes. Anyway, um, and, and even Notre Dame, even uh, schools outside of Kansas. Um, but these would be Western concepts of leisure. Here's the the band on the bandstand, the baseball nine, you know, the great uh, American pastime already. You know, Haskell has a, a team by 1890 or so. Basketball, a relatively new game. In fact, Haskell started its, its team the, the same year that, that James Naismith came here uh, to, to start the basketball program at KU. Football, a very popular sport, probably the most famous um, figure to come out of um, the Haskell sports program, although he was only there when he was very young and went on to to be more associated with Carlisle, this is Jim Thorpe, but he did in fact attend Haskell um, from the age of 11 uh, to about 15 and he says in, um, in some of his uh, autobiographical material that he left behind that it was at Haskell that he was first introduced to football and, and came to, to love it. Some have suggested that um, um, the sports, in particular football, um, are really much more than a game, uh, that they represent um, um, a metaphor for um, old warrior societies, for um, fighting against uh, non-Indians in a, a, a sanctioned uh, field, uh, etc. Jim Thorpe began uh, there at the Olympics in 1912, when, which he was so well known for. So an assault on identity and language is primary among those. Language and identity are uh, rather inextricably intertwined. Um, there's a recent book out that has been getting quite a bit of press and I thought I'd mention um, David Truer, um, his work on language. Um, he is Ojibwa or Anishinaabe uh, from Princeton, uh, has this new book out called Res Life and uh, in a recent article um, he, he says, he's speaking particularly about re language revitalization today, he says, to claim that Indian cultures can continue without Indian languages only hastens our end, even if it makes us feel better about ourselves, our cultures, and our languages as unique, identifiable, and particular entities are linked to our sovereignty. You take children at such a tender age as this and begin to pull away from them everything that makes them who they are, uh, you can see that um, an intended consequence and one that does come to light is um, the loss of Indian languages uh, that are desperately trying to be reclaimed today. So contradictions again, um, expectations and, and reality. Um, just because you tell somebody they can't use their language doesn't mean they don't. Uh, and there's lots of evidence um, that those languages continue, not least of which is the fact that many of them still exist today. And it's not just one generation of students who went to places like Haskell, it's subsequent generations 
Um, in fact, it becomes very much a normative part of the American Indian experience by the early uh, 20th century. So students are doing things covertly. You know, they don't want to get their hands wrapped with a ruler or their mouths washed out with soap or get locked in a room or something for speaking their languages, but they're still doing it. Um, they're still practicing their religion. Um, there's been an ongoing fight in um, Lawrence for 20 plus years now over the Haskell wetlands. Um, and um, there are a number of reasons for that, but let's just pick one, and that is that it is considered to be a sacred place. It's considered to be sacred um, also for a number of reasons. Uh, one is because it was a place that students often uh, sneaked away to, um, to meet with each other and perhaps to um, you know, speak with each other um, informally in their own languages, uh, under the, or, or away from, rather, the eyes of administrators. Um, they sneaked away there perhaps to conduct rituals and things like mm -hmm. that, away from uh, the prying eyes of um, officials. Um, and parents often came to visit surreptitiously in that area because it's, it's a pretty big area. It's hard to, uh, to ferret out just anybody who might be down there. And so this was a place where they could connect to, to home. Um, an unintended consequence, again, and this is some, one of those great contradictions, is that even if there's a covert use of native languages going on, the students have to be able to communicate with each other. And they're coming from all of these multiple tribal backgrounds. So English becomes the, the lingua franca. English becomes the way that they um, begin to learn about each other and their own experiences, their own tribal experiences, and a new kind of pan-Indian identity is emerging, a pan-tribal identity, to where they say, you know, we're all in the same boat here together now. And, and the word Indian becomes rather catch-all in much the same way that administrators use it because they don't deign to see the differences between a Winnebago and a, a Navajo or something like that, other than the area from which they come, perhaps. Um, but this pan-tribal identity emerges and it melds also with that experience of going to school. So here's a graduating class, 1892, and it's safe to say, and, and you may be able to tell by looking, you know, there are some rather different features among these students, um, suggesting, um, at least to my eye, and I'm pretty sure I'm right, uh, that they are from quite different tribal backgrounds. Haskell um, is a total institution, as sociologists would call it. It's something where your identity is submerged, like a prison, like a, a mental institution. Um, you're a number, you're uh, a case file, something like that. Um, your culture, your background, your family, those things aren't important. But Indian cultures survive, and I use this building to represent the total institution because it's this nice, dark, photo of this kind of cold um, brick uh, facade. This is the dedication of the stadium at Haskell, which is still there in 1926. And um, these are all Blackfeet Indians. Um, they represent um, visiting members of Haskell students' families. But in 1926, you're still seeing a, a, a vibrancy of culture despite, at that point, well, 40 some years of this education. Narrative then is a, a third um, aspect of, of the conference and, and Pratt, as I said, loved the visual narrative. He loved those contrasts of Indians past and present and I showed you a couple pictures um, from Carlisle. Um, these are from Haskell or Lawrence or Haskell students. Um, on your left um, is um, a Pawnee Indian. Um, the father of the student, William Pollock, standing on your right. And this appeared in an article um, about Haskell Institute in the 1890s. And that's that same sort of idea, contrasting past and present. William Pollock, incidentally, I could do a whole talk on him, um, comes up through the school, is really well re uh, renowned for his painting abilities, uh, not native painting but painting the wagons in the school shop. Um, some believe he first conceived of the design that still is used uh, as the Haskell 
um, mascot today with the with the full headdress and, and so forth. Um, Pollock goes on to be something of a recruiter for the school among his people and others, accompanying superintendents to Indian villages and Indian uh, reservations to uh, persuade others uh, of the, the good works at the school. He goes on to be one of the Rough Riders under Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt, in fact, on a visit to Lawrence in the uh, early um, 20th century, um, speaking about William Pollock, who at that point had, had um, I guess this would be about 1912, something like that. Um, Pollock, who had died at that point, um, was visibly moved when he saw Haskell students uh, lying in the streets um, in, the, in the downtown parade um, that was meant for him, got out of his uh, car, came over and spoke with them, and um, told them that William Pollock was the bravest soldier that he had ever served with. The parade in downtown Lawrence, not the same one I just mentioned, but uh, you know, again, this visual narrative, Indians of the past and what we're doing now. So pictures speak a lot, and I think that's why uh, Pratt and other administrators like to use them, um, but we can't really know what's inside somebody's mind, you know, even if it looks one way in a picture. Native American cultures have always been adept at adaptation and using the things that are of some utility to them within their own cultural frameworks but hanging on to uh, traditions. And this picture isn't from Haskell or any of the other schools, but I love it. It's just such a great uh, contrast. You know, um, this technology that has some use, uh, but um, the maintenance of tradition at the same time. Um, there's a written narrative as well, and, and that's, I think, a lot of what you'd see if you went and looked at um, um, the things surrounding Haskell, archivally speaking, um, the government reports, uh, the superintendent's reports from the school, you know, there's a lot of that stuff, uh, lots and lots of paper you could wade through. Here's what we're doing, here's how successful we are at it, etc. But Indian people themselves are constructing a narrative, and they're constructing it as they go. Uh, again, I think with an eye towards adaptation, rather than strictly adoption. Um, one of my favorite things that I've um, looked at are, are the letters that students write, um, whether it be back to parents or whether it be to administrators at the school or things like that. They've been taught to keep a record, and they become very adroit at doing that. Um, so um, one letter that I reference here from a student, a young student about nine years old, Julia Stand, um, writes to Charles Robinson in 1888 or 9, and she's thanking him for his, quote, kindly care. Uh, and Robinson represents a real switch from the uh, administration that had existed at Haskell before him, which was very militaristic, um, very geared towards uh, corporal punishment, et cetera. So it's kind of a, a sweet uh, letter. Um, and it speaks to something that we wouldn't necessarily expect when we think about what these institutions were like. Uh, Robinson himself, uh, leaves behind a lot of material um, that indicates he was um, pretty uh, open-minded uh, to what students had to say. Um, for instance, um, I found among his effects, his papers at the, the Kansas State Historical Society, a petition from students that uh, asked him, um, firstly, why the, so many students were dying. Um, there happened to be a, a, a particularly a virulent uh, epidemic of measles while he was um, superintendent. So another great contradiction, because you, you have kind of this, this um, more fatherly figure that Indians respond to, um, but in the midst of that, the, the, this cruel twist of fate that, that an epidemic uh, rolls through the school. Um, so firstly, that in that petition, which they obviously are not afraid to sign by name, 